honored to present to you tonight Jill Kaplan, Vice President and Publisher of Crane's New York Business. Uh, Jill is also a member of the Board of the Partnership for New York City, of the Lincoln Center Corporate Fund, and of the Business Council of New York State, among many other civic activities. And of course, last but not least, she is on the board of the Manhattan Chamber of Commerce. But when I talked to Jill, I found her personal story very interesting and I think that you would like to get to know her a little bit better as a person and do that in addition to talking about some of the business issues that face the media and face New York. So um, Jill, thank you so much for joining us this evening. I think we're going to have a great time and why don't we start with you. Now you grew up in a small town outside of Syracuse, New York. Tell me a little bit about your family. I was, I am very blessed with having just a terrific uh, family. We grew up in a little town in upstate New York. Uh, very humble beginnings, very simple. Uh, both my parents worked, and my mother to this day says that it's incredible that, she, that I work because she likes to tell people about how I used to stand in the driveway crying when my mother would leave, like on a Saturday night if my parents went to go see a movie or something. So she finds it incredibly ironic that I work in the way that I do so but it was a uh, it was a very simple but very sweet kind life uh, that we led and I think it was uh, a very foundational way that my parents raised my sister and I and when you were three years old something happened in your father's career that also had a profound influence on you yeah I um, I had shared with Alice you know it's funny I have two little kids and I was you don't realize, and actually I hadn't actually thought about this story, Alice, in, in years, about what you remember as a kid. And I, we lived uh, in a little town, as Alice meant, uh, mentioned, outside of Syracuse, and it was a, a winter night. And my dad came home, it was dark outside, and we were sitting in the kitchen waiting for my dad to come home. And I was maybe five, and my sister was three, and we were sitting at the dinner table waiting for daddy to come home. And he came in, and I didn't know what had happened, and he was very, very upset. And I remember he reached behind his back and he tore his suit off his back because his company had gone out of business and we had lost everything. And my mom was crying, getting the goosebumps thinking about this. And it was one of those things where I was really scared because I didn't, I, you know, I couldn't comprehend seeing my dad do something like that. It seemed so out of character. He was such an easygoing, loving guy. And it had a very profound effect on me at a very young age and, you know, in really thinking about taking care of your family and being safe and secure. And as a result of that, um, we sold our house and we moved to Albany to live with my grandparents. And, um, you know, it, it just, it certainly shaped uh, a lot of my early thinking about work and career and money and family and things like that, but we were a family. You know, that was the one thing that my parents were very clear about, is that they loved us, uh, they loved my sister and I, and that nothing was going to take that away. And, you know, we might not have something monetarily, but we had each other, and that's what was core. And it was as a family that your parents got back on their feet, right? Yep. Yep, and um, my folks started uh, a little real estate company and they opened, you know, like a shingle and they were a traditional small business owner, a mom and pop shop. They worked seven days a week. Um, they were in the residential real estate industry. My father hated it, absolutely hated it. And I remember, you know, my mom was always on the road and part of my sister, what we would do is we'd load the signs in, we'd take the signs out. They had like those big, you know, um, like grass signs that you would put and, you know, you'd have to get them in and it was hard during the winter when the ground was frozen. Oh. You know, that was our job. Um, but that's how we started to get back. But it, it took quite a while um, before we were able to kind of get out on our own, so to speak. And so during that tough time, um, Jill told me a story about grocery shopping that was really um, almost hard to listen to. If you would share it, then you can be, have it hard to listen to as well. Yeah, so. um, I, was, I was sharing, I don't even know how we started, how I even ended up telling you the story, but I was telling Alice how when I was a kid, we used to go, there was a local A&P, and we'd go in and to the left, you'd go into the produce section. And to the right were, you know, 
cereal and all that other stuff. We go, always go to the left first, and we go all the way to the back, and the way that our grocery store was is that there was, um, you know, the swinging doors, and that was where the meat guys would come out to bring um, stuff, but there was a cart all the way in the back, and it was all the bruised fruits and vegetables, and they had a, you know, they were all marked down, and that's where we shopped, and, um, and I hated it. I, I, abs I really hated it, and yet, you know, I, I, I wanted to be there for my mom, um, but I, I found it, I, I mean, I hate to, but I, I found it embarrassing, and, you know, I just, I really, it had just this profound effect on me, and then we'd, you know, move to the, the can aisle where they'd have the crushed cans, and they'd put the black lines through the cans, and, you know, but it was what it was, and, um, you know, and you just learn to get by. And, it, you know, it's not to say we didn't have a roof over our head. We did. We had each other, and, you know, we were able to buy food. But it wasn't in the same way that kids that I went to school with lived, so to yeah. speak. Um, and my mom, and that was, and the other thing about my mom, which was interesting, uh, is that she worked. And I hate, I mean, as I mentioned before, I hated it. Absolutely hated it. I just thought it was just such a... An embarrassing thing because at that where we you know in this little community we lived in somewhat of a rural community none of the moms worked and so my mom was the only she was always late for pickup you know because she was running from one appointment to the other um, when we came home we were you know uh, latchkey kids and nobody was there with you know to greet me or you know to give hug and milk and cookies and all that other kind of stuff that when I went to my friend's house they had and um, you know, but it, in the end, I was, as I got older, I became just immensely proud of what she did and what she accomplished and all that she pushed through. So, um, you know, she's an amazing human being who, both my parents, frankly, you know, who've taught me so much and um, I feel very grateful that they're still with me. And you yourself became very enterprising during this. You yourself became very enterprising as a child during this period. <laughs> yes, yes. Tell us some of the things that you did. Um, well, I, I did anything. Um, I walked dogs. I cleaned. One of my favorite jobs was I worked for, this was, do you guys remember, a, bunch, a lot of people are too young to remember this, but when fake nails first came out, they used to have this thing. I worked for a woman, it was called Nails by Nancy, and they would wrap this like uh, mold and I would paint acrylic nails and that was like a great job because you got a lot of great tips and I would go with Nancy and I'd go you know you know it just ranged I worked at CVS I worked at Dunkin Donuts I just whatever jobs I babysat a lot um, but it was it was my I guess way of feeling like I could take that I'd be able to take care of my family take care of myself um, and establish a level of independence but the Nails by Nancy was one of my, actually, oh, and I worked in a chocolate factory. That was really good. Ooh. I made clusters. I made uh, uh, turtles. I made bark. I don't eat chocolate anymore because I ate so much when I worked in that. And, um, yeah, so. That's great. And you wanted uh, to go to a particular school. That was part of the motivation, right? Yes. Um, I had felt that I in my perception at that time in my life um, there was a great sense that I went to this big regional high school and I had felt the private school would be a better place for me um, that I would have a better education it would create better opportunities and it you know and part of my working was to try and be able to afford to send myself which I was not able to do um, and it never came to fruition okay. but I uh, just you know I longed for something like that and I guess you know today I think about I think that education is one of the greatest gifts that you can give your children um, and how it's so fundamentally important and you went to college uh, and your major was economics at I graduated from Clark University. Okay. And w after you graduated from Clark, you told me that you wanted to be a stockbroker like your father or go to Wall Street, but fate led you in a different direction. Tell, tell us how you made your next life choice and where you went. Okay. Um, I, I had a great, there were a group of uh, friends, and so I was very enamored with New York but I was equally enamored with Los Angeles. And I was like, what are we gonna do? What are we gonna do? And at that time, the market had crashed. And 
there um, were no jobs, frankly, on Wall Street. And so I, with my girlfriend Danielle, we decided that we were going to flip a coin. And heads was New York and tails was, uh, was LA. So we ended up in New York. And I wasn't able to find a job anywhere close to Wall Street. But I had gone through my career um, center. And I had, there was a profile. Newsweek used to publish a publication called Careers. And I saw this woman on the front cover. And I read about what she did. And I thought, oh my god, that sounds like a piece of cake. I'd love that job. And it was about being an ad sales rep. And it just sounded really interesting and fun. And you met a lot of people. and. Um, and it felt like I would be able to enjoy that and have a level of independence and be in New York. And I started off on my pursuit. Um, and I remember I was, my, uh, my dad, I was talking to him about what I should do. Like, how do you get your resume through? It was like a very daunting thing. You know, you're this kid in some little tiny town in upstate New York. And he said, well, why don't you write your objective is success? And I was like, oh, I can't do that, Dad. He's like, oh, yeah, 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 do that. I'm like, Dad, that's really like out there. He's like, I'm telling you, if you put that on your resume, people are going to call you because they're either they're going to think you're an idiot or fantastic. So I said, all right. So I um, or very brash. And I said, all right. And he was right. And I got, you know, people were like, I don't think you're a great fit for this job, but I just kind of had to meet the person who would put this on the resume. And um, and I, I had a great time coming to interview. I actually, uh, just on 2nd Avenue was uh, where I first started. And I started kind of on my journey. And it has been, an, I mean, I feel very fortunate. It's been a great journey. And what was your first job? Where were you? Uh, the first job, I worked for Times Mirror Magazines. And I worked for a trade publication in the sporting goods industry. And I really had absolutely no idea what I was doing. I, I, I truly had not a clue. But what I did know is that somebody was going to give me a paycheck, that I was going to be able to travel, which was basically getting into a car, going to New Jersey, or going to Connecticut. It wasn't that glamorous, but I was really, it was that, this notion of being able to drive and, and be independent. And I, I, I really enjoyed it, because you became in the in the role that I was in there, you became very much a part of a community. So I was part of this um, sporting goods community, which was kind of a interesting. So it ranged everywhere from like the sneaker people when this was when like Reebok was coming out with all these colored sneakers and licensed products was exploding, and it ranged all the way to the other side, which was uh, I would go to a show called the Shot Show. The Shot Show, one of my favorites was the shooting, hunting, and outdoor trade show. Well, let me tell you what it was like to be in Vegas with like 60,000 people. I mean, it's interesting today that How many women of the 60,000? Oh, my. they were all, I mean, other than the women who were. The models. The models who were <laughs> scantily clothed. I mean, 95, 96% of the folks that were there. It was outrageous. It was, it was crazy. I had never quite seen anything. I also went to another, like the fishing tackle. So anyway, it was quite, uh, you know, it was quite glamorous. But it was a really interesting learning experience. I enjoyed selling. I enjoyed, enjoyed working with people. And um, I learned a lot. I learned about growing a career. I had a very interesting manager there, different managers. You learn different skills, you know, working with different people. Um, but it was, it was, it was fun. It was really quite fun. And I think that that's you know, one of the things that I've always tried to take with me in the roles that I've been in is, and, and especially when I'm talking to young people, and I tell people what I think is really important and critical about work is that you're having fun in your job. Now, not every single day is going to be the perfect fun day, but I think if you're having fun, you're doing really good work, and you're able to be creative and enterprising. And that, to me, was a, a great turn on in you know, not being doing the exact same thing every single day. That was really kind of intoxicating for me. And you did grow in your job, and you went to the Wall Street Journal I eventually. Did. Now, I stopped at The Economist for a little while, okay. um, and, which was quite fun, because it was this really weird, quirky publication that was very irreverent and smart. And it was just coming to the States. And it was really cool to kind of uh, represent and be a part of that brand. But then I did move to the journal. And that was a tremendous ride. I mean, 
Now, you had a surprise. Just as you were about to go to the journal, you found out something. Yeah. Well, this was actually while I was still, I was well, so I had been at the journal. Oh, and sorry. And we were starting the whole consumer division. Mm -hmm. And there, uh, we, were, we launched a, a product called the Weekend Journal. And I really wanted this job. I mean, it was like one of those times in your career where you kind of say, I want this job. This is it. I, I could feel it. I could taste it. I knew I wanted it. And I went to interview for it, and I had a you know, really nice interview. And I had recently been married. And I found out the night after I had this interview that I was pregnant. And I was kind of like, this is not happening. This can't be possible. It's not real. Like, it was quite shocking um, but it was real and I called the gentleman who had interviewed and I was working within the company and I said I got to talk to you about something and he said what's wrong and I started to tell him the story and I you know, really grappled with whether or not it was the right thing to do because I didn't want him to feel up against a wall but I also knew that I wanted the job very badly and if I at actually, if I was actually given the opportunity to take the job, that what felt worse and what I couldn't sleep on was knowing that I, I was pregnant and that I was going to tell him after he hired me. Like, that just felt fundamentally wrong. And so it was a, we it was a weird conversation because, you know, you go to someone you're interviewing with, and I, but I just told him straight out, this is, you know, what's going on. This is how I feel. I don't want you to feel in any way. I get it. There are other candidates out there. If you think I'm the best person for the job, then you should, you know, that I'd like you to hire me. And um, in the end, he actually said that through the process, because we went through the process for a while, and I wasn't telling anyone else I was pregnant, um, the fact that I had been honest and direct was in the end why he ended up hiring me, in addition to some other reasons. But, um, but he just felt that that was important. And as a matter of fact, they ended up promoting me the next time I had a baby. So, each time I was pregnant, they had promoted me. So it was very nice. It was very nice. And uh, it, was, it was great. I have to say, you have had some enormous accomplishments while you were at the Wall Street Journal. And until I got to know Jill, I did not realize, and I'd like you to tell the audience more about the fact that this woman is responsible for some of the best sections in that newspaper, at yeah. least my favorites. You mentioned Weekend Journal. But tell us, tell us some more of what you did there. Well, first of all, I was part of a great team, so it takes a village. Um, and I actually, it, the woman who was really my partner in crime is an amazing woman. Her name is Joanne Littman, and she was, quote unquote, my editor, uh, and I was her business person. And we were, I think, a great team because she was a young woman who also had children. She was a little bit older than I was. And we had a mutual respect for one another. I had a tremendous respect for the process and what we were looking to build. She had a tremendous respect for the business, you know, challenges and opportunities that creating a consumer voice for the journal provided. And it was just, it was awesome. I mean, we just were able to have this extraordinary brand that we were bringing to market and to be able to help define um, individuals in a way that people had not thought about. So here are business folks, you know, Morgan Stan, you know, people who critically needed and wanted to read the paper, but yet they had a life outside of their job. And it was a very easy story to tell. It was a very compelling story to tell. And it was great. I mean, it was really, um, an e it was, I have to say, it was like an easy story. It made sense. You were able to talk about, well, yes, they travel for business, but guess what? They make a lot of money and they travel a lot for, you know, personal reasons and take great vacations and drive terrific cars and, you know, but it was, it was just kind of at its infant stages and no one had talked about the paper in that way. And so, it was a tremendous opportunity that I felt um, really fortunate. And again, but it was, it was a great group of people that were totally jazzed. And uh, we also built Weekend Edition, uh, which is the Saturday paper. And uh, that product we worked on, I used to joke, for so long I had two kids on that project. So we spent a lot of time analyzing, because it was a weird thing. People were like, oh, I don't want to see the journal on the weekend. That's work. I don't want to do it. So it, um, but it all came together, and um, I think it's you know it's been a nice legacy, and a nice opportunity. And frankly, and part of uh, what happened through that experience is that I started to uh, work with the news department very 
closely, and we had never had that kind of relationship. There had never been a, um, a business person who was allowed, if you will, uh, to interact with the news group. And so that was, I think, to some degree, even a more rewarding experience to be able to be a part of that news process and to help to shape the different products that we were putting out and to be able to have a level of confidence and respect and trust for collaborating. And I think, you know, credit to, to management for supporting having that collaboration, which you today see in the media industry, but you never saw that. There was, a, you know, they call about church and state. Mm -hmm. It was church and it was state and there was nothing crossing over. Um, so to be able to be that bridge was, I think, a benefit to the brand in bringing it forward at a critical time. And now while you were doing all of this, of course, one of the great things about Personal Journal and Weekend Journal is they cover a lot of work-life issues. Mm. Was it an advantage for you to be a working mother while you were running these projects at, the, at Dow Jones? Um, How would you describe the way you felt about being a working mother in that culture? Um, this is the hot seat question. Yeah, um, you know, I loved work. I, I, you know, it was, as I hope I've expressed, it was an amazing experience. I was, loved being there. Um, it, was, it, was, it was a hard balance. There was no balance. It was, it was a very challenging uh, period of my, uh, in my career um, in making, being asked to make very difficult choices. And, you know, certain people make those choices and that's what works in their life. Um, it didn't feel like it was working in my life. And I, I didn't necessarily always feel that we practice, and, and every department was different, but in, in the group that I was in, we didn't necessarily practice what we preached in the paper. We had a column of Sue Schellenberger. I don't know if any of you remember this. It's called Work and Family, and it talked a lot about the chat. Because listen, the, the bottom line is, there, I, I, at least in my humble opinion, there is no necessary balance. It's like I have a list that keeps going and going and going, and it never, I don't, but I don't think you, you can be anyone, and you never complete that list, because it just keeps growing. Um, but that was, uh, and, but the, you know, the interesting thing is until I came to Crane, I didn't realize that I didn't have it. I just did it. I was in what I called like the mommy holding pattern. Like I, I kind of knew how to move around, get done when I needed to get done. Um, my family, my folks, my friend, you know, it's like, and work. And I worked all the time. I mean, I remember the, one of the funniest things is when I started at Crane, it was, a, I started on a Thursday and because it was 9-11, um, uh, which I'd had a, like all of us had, a, I didn't want to start my first day on 9-11, and then my kid, my daughter was starting school, and so I started the next day. So on Saturday, I get up, you know, at 7 a.m., and I look at my Blackberry, because I looked at my Blackberry 365, I mean, like many, and I looked at it, and I was like, wow, this is so weird, there's not one message. I thought it was so, and so then like an hour later, like I made coffee, I made breakfast, I look and I'm like, this is so freaking weird. There's not, no one's emailing me. So at nine, I said to my husband, Wayne, I'm like, Wayne, this is, I, I don't understand this. I, he, oh, it must be broken. Your server must be down. I said, yeah, yeah, you're right. He goes, why don't you send yourself an email? So I sent the email and it popped up. And I was like, oh my God. I'm like, no, you know, there weren't 17 frantic emails. And it was, you know, really an incredibly impactful moment because it spoke to the Crane family, not that there's not always a sense of urgency, we have an incredible sense of urgency, but there's a level of respect. And when I was initially talking to the Cranes, they said, you know, we believe your family's first, your friends are second, you know, and if you take care of those elements, then you'll be a happy employee and you'll be a good employee and you'll be able to take the, care of the rest of the family. So, you know, it's kind of a, it was, it's a neat experience that um, I think I had as well as, you know, just coming to Crane um, from the journal. Why don't you talk now a little bit about Cranes, the mission of Cranes, how it fits into the New York media ecosystem mm -hmm. so people understand more about what you do. Sure. Um, so we are, people often say, who do you quote unquote compete with? And I say all the time, everyone, 
and no one at all because we cross so many different industries. We report on 23 different economic sectors that drive the New York City economy. Um, we are the voice of the business community and very proudly the voice of the business community. And we try um, to encompass uh, the entire community from enterprise to small business owners, entrepreneurs, and the middle marketplace. So it's, it's a wide swath, if you will, but that's what makes it so incredibly, I think, dynamic and fascinating and interesting. Reporting on, you know, Nancy was talking about our event yesterday. We have a lot of events. I, too, would like to thank the sponsors because we put on a lot of events, so you guys are great for supporting things like this. And, and Nancy, of course, and that was a, a political event. So the, the range in, um, in our voice, if you will, is, is quite varied. And it's just a remarkable platform that we get to operate off of. Now, you started out selling advertising, and you're now very involved with the print world. Social media, which was brought up at the very beginning of mm -hmm. this conversation, obviously is having a very profound transformative effect. In fact, even Vanity Fair is starting to look a bit skinny these days because of the changes in advertising. So why don't you give us your take on the future of media and of, of print media? Um, I know what you're doing may be somewhat proprietary, but tell us what you can about your thoughts and Crane's thoughts. Uh, what's the media going to look like in 10 years, mm. if you know? <laughs> We'd all love to know. Yeah, you know, um, we talk about that a lot. And I wish I had a crystal ball to say, this is what's going to happen. I remember five years ago, people said print would be gone. Gone. It would just evaporate. Um, I, I'm particularly fascinated today by the app world, because I think that apps, in many way, ways, if you will, are replacing the print product. And if you look at um, kind of the experience of the app and the, you know, almost like the flipping and the interaction with the ads, that to me is kind of the closest linkage between print and where we're going. Um, I don't know how many of you folks still read books. Um, I certainly love print pages, but I also read iBooks and I read on a Kindle. And, you know, I'm fascinated with that and, and how you um, monetize that model because at the end of the day, and I think that this is the greatest challenge as well as the greatest opportunity for media companies is being able to transition into this new world, but yet recognizing when you have a news department, it's, you know, it's a business. At the end of the day, we need to pay our journalists. And so I remember um, meeting this gentleman who was telling me how he was very angry at the um, Cleveland Plain Dealer that they were charging him. And I said, sir, I said, well, how else would you expect to get your news? And you know, there is a place for citizen uh, journalism. Absolutely, absolutely. But I believe in my heart of hearts that it does not replace the art and the skill of journalists and reporters who are in the field reporting on hard business stories and having editors that are curating these stories for the community. Um, so, and I think, you know, with social media, that's also fascinating. And I use, I guess, my children somewhat as a benchmark because they're 10 and 12, and Facebook is not even on their radar screen. They, they don't, they have no interest in Facebook at all. Um, they're very into Instagram and Snapchat. I mean, like every day there's something new, but just you know the, the, how quickly it moves is remarkable. Um, but yet we're in that bit. You know, we we're you know all of our journalists are tweeting. We have Facebook page, um, LinkedIn. I mean, certainly it's it's incredibly important, and we continue to invest time and energy and training um, through those mediums. And we see that our audience is growing and diversifying, and it's important and it's essential, and is where the market is going. Um, but I, you know, do I think that there will be a print product? Um, I don't know, you know, I don't know. Because five years ago, I really doubted it, to be honest with you. And today, it's um, for us and our business model, like I tell our staff uh, all the time that I want to lessen our dependency on the drug called print. Because it is such a dominant, you know, when you spend, say, $100 for a page in advertising, 
and you can buy a banner for three dollars that margins pretty significant you gotta make that up and still be able to pay you know your entire staff so but that to me is the incredibly fun part of what we're doing and the ability to figure that out I call it failing forward like I tell you to my staff let's fail forward let's figure this out it's not you know it's not a mistake if we're you know learning and not everything is a home run it's okay to have a double it's okay to have a single but you know if we don't learn and course correct from these then that's a problem but that's kind of where I, I guess it so as long as we're on media, there's one thing I, I really am curious about your opinion on is, as I have written, I have become keenly aware of the fact that many people do not recognize the difference between someone who casually blogs and professionally edited journalism, because it's not transparent to them, the work that has gone into the professionally edited journalism. Mm -hmm. Do you see a future for stratification or um, finding a way to present different kinds of journalism in ways where the readers can understand the product better that they're getting and see the value add? Yeah, I mean, we, I mean we're actually looking at that very thing right now. So um, we're looking at creating a business blogger network. And so within uh, the boroughs, across different industries, these are not our journalists, but these are people that we have great respect for as business leaders in the community. We will clearly delineate between what is content that is curated through Crane's eyes and through our journalists versus what is curated from a business leader. And I think that that stratification is critically important and a lot of the work that goes into that is through your marketing and branding work. Um, I think that there are, you know, you look at, I remember years ago we had a, an editorial board with um, a well-known a well -known restaurateur and he said the thing that worried him the most was the blogosphere because these are not journalists and so you get one person who's had a bad you know a bad meal or a bad day with service and all of a sudden that becomes the standard by which people um, you know are evaluating it so you know I think that there's a place for both and I think that it's important that you have uh, a robust network of journalists that are able to tell the story in a, an objective well-sourced manner I think that certainly the blogosphere and citizen journalism and, and things along those lines, the trip advisors, the Yelps and those guys, you know, there's a place for that. Um, and part of, I think, our industry's job is to help evangelize the need for serious journalism. And, you know, that's something that I feel pretty passionate about. I keep waiting for the subscription offer that says, check here for $10 a month if you would like your news fact-checked. And, and just put that baldly, the answer would be very simply, hell yes, you right. know, as opposed to just something someone makes up, and right. which is, but it, it never comes across that way, so I applaud you for going oh, in that you. direction. Thank I think that's you. terrific. Um, of course, media is also one of New York City's great industries and it's being affected by the internet, but there are profound economic changes going on in a lot of New York City's great industries, fashion, retail, arts, culture, um, advertising, Wall Street, you name it. So because you cover those 23 industry segments, you have this fabulous bird's eye view over the whole New York economic landscape. And I'm wondering if this isn't asking too much of you, if you could tell us um, a I little bit about um, what you see in terms of rising industries, um, you know, uh, what might happen, you know, what are the great growth industries that you're seeing emerge in the city? Um, I think, you know, the two immediate ones that come to mind are certainly the digital tech community. I mean, that's something that we at Crane have reported on for a while. And it's not, uh, you know, people think about digital tech and often kind of lump that in as an advertising initiative or a media uh, product. But digital tech is so many things. I mean, it's 
fintech and biotech and there's so many different ways that you get at kind of digital technology and I think that the, you know New York early on identified this as a core uh, need to help diversify the economy as we were looking at what was transpiring on Wall Street and has done a really solid job in being able to build this sector and attract talent um, and venture capital dollars and you know I think that one of the and, and frankly the, um, the whole initiative with uh, Cornell I think is going to be a phenomenal boost for our economy in being able to really retain incredible talent and to be able to incubate phenomenal you know the next Google or Foursquare or, or um, Facebook um, I think the fact that Google spent 1.8 billion dollars on buying the old Port Authority building down in Chelsea is you know is a testament to what New York can be in um, the digital tech community in Silicon Alley versus Silicon Valley um, you know another area that I'm personally fascinated with and I think that New York has really started um, to make a lot of inroads with this is the food industry that's another area that and you look at I'm particularly fascinated with Brooklyn and what's happening there with the artisanal cheeses and mustards and it's just an incubator for so many and up in the Bronx with some of the commercial kitchens phenomenal products interesting products that are coming out and, and actually one of the other this is like a total niche thing but there was a, a bill passed uh, called the New York State Farm Dist uh, Distilling uh, Act and so all of a sudden you see these micro um, producers of liquor so you've got you know people producing rum and whiskey and I, I think that those are you know interesting I mean the healthcare industry continues to be incredibly strong education I think will only become stronger um, the tourism sector and all that that I mean you look at like the hotel explosion um, our old editor Greg David loves to you know quote where we are I think it's like at 90,000 uh, hotel rooms today which is just this amazing growth number and I mean, I have a friend who lives in Peru, and, and she very she truly, you know, you hear this old adage that people will come with empty suitcases. She comes with empty suitcases and fills them up and goes back home. She just, you know, she loves it. Uh, so those are, you know, some of the areas that, I, that, we, that we're watching and we think are interesting. I was going to ask you about tourism specifically because sometimes it feels almost like living in Disneyland um, when you're here in New York, especially around the holidays. And um, how big a part of the city's economy is tourism now? And do you think that that has a lot of room to grow? Are you seeing that as becoming a major, major business of the city? It already is, but I mean, it's, you know. I think it's what's, you know, insulated us from what we saw around the country absolutely um, I, I mean it's just it's 50 million tourists coming through New York right. shopping going to theater staying in hotels um, going to restaurants is just a tremendous driver of this economy and do I see it continuing um, I hope so you know I mean I think that it will be very interesting or kind of pivotal the mayor uh, mayor bloomberg has really identified investment in marketing new york as a way to drive economic development and you know that remains to be seen what will happen with the next person who's in city hall so that leads us to the subject of the mayor i, I would really love to hear um, what you think will be the most important legacies of the Bloomberg administration? Oh, goodness. You know, I... I Besides giant soft drinks and... Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, there's so many things. I, I guess, you know, I, as I sit in our, my perch at Cranes, and it should be noted that this phenomenal young lady right here is really... Um, Alaire Townsend is, uh, is our rock star, superstar, and uh, an amazing woman that I was, uh, will never fill her shoes, but um, I had the pleasure of following. So, you know, where we are today, credit goes to Alaire um, as well. And I think, you know, his legacy to me is, is being a business minded mayor, somebody who really understands the needs and is invested 
in the community to help drive economic development, to help drive innovation, to help drive creativity, and be able to make New York safe. I mean, if there's one thing that I worry about more than anything, it's safety. I think that that is the critical um, point that I would impress upon the next mayor, whoever that person may be, is having a safe city means that you are going to have tourists that are going to come to um, New York. You're going to have investment in New York. You're going to have an economy. I mean, I, I really, I, I mean, I hate to say it, but you know, I worry about tourism. And you know, God forbid something happened, it would take out our economy. It would have devastating effect. And so the investment in security, to me, is, is a key, key issue. And you think about you know, back t uh, 20 years ago where we were, and it was not quite the same place. So that, uh, you know. So let's break out the fairy dust and, and wave the magic wand then and let's say that you're the next mayor and this will be the last hot seat question. Um, but if safety is the most important priority, specifically, what would you do if you were the next mayor? What would I personally do? I mean, I, I think that I would, um, I would make sure that we had the um, investment in our police force and various security elements to keep our city safe, to keep our citizens safe. Um, and I guess the other thing I'm going to is, is just an investment in infrastructure. You know, you look at what happened with Sandy, and it's you know it's crazy what transpired. I mean, I had, I was um, running into the ladies' room uh, earlier today, and one of our journalists, I said, how are you, Amanda? And she's like, I'm okay. I'm like, what's wrong? And she said, ah, I just came from, like, a, a meeting at my apartment building. And it, I said, are you still out of your apartment? So she has been out of her apartment for three months. She does not know when she's going to go back. Um, so I think this that is in Manhattan, or she lives in, Lo in Queens, in, in, Queens. in uh, mm -hmm. Long Island City. So the the need to ensure that our infrastructure is in top shape is key in my mind. It's critically important. So okay, so we have our agenda, and I'd like to thank you, Jill. This thank has you. been thank absolutely you, wonderful. Oh, we have time for a few questions from the audience. If anybody would like to ask a question, uh, leap forth. We have one right here. How do you, with all the technology, oh, sorry, I figured I'm loud, um, <laughs> right? How, with all the technology happening, um, do you, as a magazine, um, I mean, I would think your best bet is to be the best curator for your readers of what is happening out there. Mm -hmm. And what is your plan on how to do that? Because for those who aren't reading the paper anymore and we're looking at it online, what, what's your plan to get our attention? Because I know myself, I, get, I can't look at all that, but whoever's curating it the best for me and for the audience you're trying to read, that's what I'm going to read mm -hmm. and I'd like to know your plan for that. Sure. Um, so I like to say that we are an agnostic platform and what I mean by that is that what works for you might not work for Alice and so we have tried to innovate in many different ways by having a print product that's our legacy product but we have built lots of brand extensions so events are an enormous part of what we do and we curate our events through many different ways so we have political events, we have industry events that are very vertical on um, you know, areas like healthcare and education. And then we have big hallmark events. One uh, event that we created is called the Future of New York City that brings together the entire community. I think that there is, um, there is a lot going on out there in the community and we try to do our very best in focusing on what's important to you 
being able to talk to our audience, being able to elicit ideas. We have something called an advisory panel that we've created so that we get feedback across many different industries to have an understanding of what's important. Is it important to have a mobile device? Is it important that you're able to, when you're commuting in from wherever you're commuting in, that you're able to consume information on your um, iPad? So it's, you know, it's, it's one of those things where we do our, uh, our best in doing the research about our audience to be able to provide them with the news and information that they can use that will better serve them in their jobs and managing their business and being able to build their businesses. And you know, sometimes that means you get it wrong and you have to close things down and we've done that too. So we test a lot. Um, because we talk to folks a lot, and I, I frankly, you know, one of the things that you, I guess, learn early on in your career is that you, you know, you have a really strong editor who's really smart and really tied um, and having tremendous intuition about what are the tension points in the marketplace. And he is, you know, uh, my phenomenal partner uh, in being able to bring to market what we feel are the best uh, products that people need to be able to do their daily work. So I hope that answers your question. Okay. Other questions? I know someone has questions. There's two, three, oh okay. One, two, three, in the back on the, on the left. A lot of us here are looking to grow our career. So who would you recommend as role models for us to aspire to and what are the qualifications we should look for in a role model? That's an interesting question. Um, you know, I've always been a big fan of looking within your organization, if that's an opportunity that you might have, um, and thinking about really kind of, I guess, looking and understanding who that person is, how did they get there? What's their personal story? What do you believe that they stand for? And being, you know, direct. I think, you know, the thing that I've learned as you move up the food chain, if you will, is it's harder and harder to have mentors. Um, but I also think when you become, uh, when you get to a certain point in your career, that it's what you do to give back. So, I mean, one of the people who I love and adore is right over there, right there, it's Alexis Sinclair, who is, uh, what I always say, is my better half. And she's just, you know, someone who I love mentoring and somebody who I love investing my time in. And I think that what has worked for our relationship is to be able to be honest and candid and direct and to be able to course correct. And a mentor is just such a, to be a mentee and to be a mentor, when you're a mentor, there's, it is one of the most fulfilling elements of my job. I mean, there's you know, a bunch of young women who I love, love working with. And I think, I think Alexis would tell you that I have an open door policy, but I'm you know, always gonna be honest and direct. And that's you know, what, you know, I think it's hard when you, you, know, you read about different people to think about them as mentees. I think it's, it's important. It's, and it could be a client, you know. It could be, but it's somebody who's directly connected to you on a regular basis that you can seek advice and, and who's available. Okay, over here and then back over here. Somebody over here had a question? Yes, in the green. Jill, it, um, I wanted to compliment you and Cranes and kind of keeping our uh, fingers on the beat of what happens in New York and bringing the events that you do uh, and, and it allows people to learn uh, so much. I was going to ask you, in, in uh, your professional life, um, I'm sure you've had a lot of people to really influence you uh, in your own growth and development. And I just wondered if you'd want to talk a, a minute or two about the influences that have really uh, put you on the direction, the trajectory that you're on now to get you to this wonderful yeah, place. No, it's an interesting question. And you know what's interesting about that? Because I don't know if anyone's ever asked me. I actually thought about people that influenced me in a negative way to learn what I didn't like. Um, 
which is interesting. I never thought about it that way. And there are two individuals in particular who um, I had one when I first first started my career. I had I worked for someone. I worked um, outside of. I worked in a satellite office, and this person was a young manager, relatively speaking, and an incredible micromanager. Like I would have to tell my assistant when I was going to the bathroom, so that if she called, she would know where I was and when I would be back. And in that moment, I realized I absolutely would never be a macro manager. It's like, what could be worse than some, having to tell my assistant when I'm going to the bathroom? I mean, that's ridiculous. Um, I think that those experiences shaped me in figuring out what I didn't want to be or didn't want to do. Um, the incredibly positive experience that I had with people who shaped me were people who really taught me about honorability and hard work and making those tough calls and being able to be in uncomfortable situations and push through them and be okay through those because sometimes they're really not, you know, you, you can't control those outcomes. And those had some very powerful, meaningful, you know, impacts on me in, I guess, shaping my career. Okay, so we had one last. Over here, we'll do one last quick question, and then we will wrap up. Whoever it was over on this side, you. Oh, yeah. well, it, then it that won't be quick because it's because. Wonderful <laughs> interview, Jill. Thank you very much for sharing such a personal story. And I'm here with my daughter, who's just beginning her professional career. Ah. She's just starting her journey. And you may have answered this, at least in my mind, how I perceived it, but I'm wondering if you could give some particular advice to somebody just starting their journey. She's in a, you know, a, a particular, she's in the advertising a, a business, um, you know, moving along quite well, but, you know, there's, there's, there are so many pitfalls, and you've been so personal in sharing your story. I'm just wondering if you have some advice to share with us or her. Um. <laughs> You know, one of the things that I was, that I tell actually young women in particular, and it's not always easy, but what I encourage people to do is fall in love with the job. Fall in love with your opportunity. What are you doing day to day? Don't, wor I mean, it, it, it's, it's easy to say and hard to do. But what I want to say is don't worry about the money. The money comes. You know, I see young people often are very um, enamored by what, you know, what I'm going to make. And I, I get that. I totally get it. Um, but I think that that, you know, kind of ends. And if you are in, I mean, when I came to Cranes, frankly, I took a major pay cut. I took, uh, you know, I, because it was the job, it was a great job, and I was going to learn, and I was going to do interesting things, and I was going to be able to grow in ways that I was not growing at the journal. And I really you know, stress to young folks, really look at what that opportunity is. And the other thing I tell people is, do you like the person you're going to work for? Because that person's pretty important. And you've got to be able to think you know, and feel that you can have some kind of candid dialogue and to be able to get along with that person. And that they're going to invest. I mean, back to your question about mentoring, they should want to invest in you. Because the, you know, my job is to have the people that work for me succeed me. That's my job, is to be able to continue to move along. That's the goal. I mean, I just I think it's so important to be able to give back to young people. but. That's what I, you know, it's like falling in love, right? There's got to be more than, you know, thinking the person's cute. It's, you know, it, it, it's, there's a lot more to it because you're going to be there a long time and spend a lot of time there. So that would be my, uh, my recommendation. Jill, thank you so much. That was absolutely you, wonderful. Alice. What a high thank note you. to end on. We really appreciate yeah. it. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Alice. Thank you very much. And Alice, thank you for your time and your investment. And I know that you and Jill have had a couple of conversations. And I hope this is a good connection for the two of you as well. So thank you all for coming this evening. We hope to see you at some of our upcoming events. Thank you to Sunita for hosting this. Thank you to our sponsors and to all of you. Uh,
Don't forget to look at the view, and don't forget to pull out your snow boots for tomorrow. <laughs> Thank you so much, and we really appreciate Jill. And one more round of applause. Thank you.